The idol worship of India. Where does this strange practice originate? Why do people bow down before stones? Do they truly believe they are bowing before a god? And if not, why then do they do it? Well, to answer that question, let's go back several thousand years to a land that is today called the Indian subcontinent, but then was not called anything, except perhaps the Indus Valley. The people who lived there did not identify themselves with any religion, sect, or ideology, but because they lived near a river called the Indus, they became to be known as Hindus. Their simple society was divided practically into the workers who performed all the menial tasks, the traders who ran small-time businesses, the bureaucrats, more powerful men who ruled over and governed the lands, and then the priests who took care of religious and intellectual activities, including the propagation of ritual practice. But there was another class of men who were all but forgotten. This was somewhat secret class of men. They were the original sadhus, original truth seekers. These men were very different. They were in search of a deeper meaning. In Europe, their counterparts were called monks. In China, they were called daoshis, and in Africa, shamans. What united them all was their passion to find truth. Some wandered off into the forest. Some were natural mystics and so stayed within society. But as these individuals found the truth and sacredness of life, they became known as the enlightened ones. Another term for this is rishi, meaning one who is in a different state of mind. These rishis had realized one simple thing, the sacredness of life. Now among this group of heretics were the original artists. They wanted to express this enlightenment artistically, and they did this through hymns, paintings, elaborate places of worship, and, peculiarly to South Asia, idols. But these were no ordinary idols. They were original, objective forms of art. They are objective because they came from a place of enlightenment, not a personal or emotional point of view. Just like the Sphinx in Egypt, the Zen paintings of China, the Great Temple of Delphi in Greece, these constructions had a certain power about them. They represented an enlightened human being, a beacon for people to aspire to. The facial expression was peaceful and arresting. The proportions were made in such a way to convey a kind of grace of posture, acting almost as an energetic field. People were struck by the beauty of these figures. That is if they were created by a true artist. The idea was, of course, to inspire and uplift the people to emulate this in their own life. This is the effect that true objective art should have. And these first statues were placed around the ancient towns. But as you know, in time, things became different. You may ask the question, if they are a form of art, why then are the idols worshipped in the way they are today? Good question. They shouldn't. As time went on, the sadhus were forgotten and lost influence. The statues remained, but their power was on the wane. Slowly people began to create copycats. Of course, the imitations didn't have the same power. The statues were misinterpreted as being objects of worship, and a corrupt group of priests then placed themselves as the middleman between people and God. To this day, you can see this practice endures in most temples. The Age of Enlightenment was in decline and the practice of idol worship was afoot. People, by and large, forgot what these stony gods actually once stood for. Original, enlightened art. And it seems most are still oblivious to it. But somewhere, perhaps, it still shines through, whether people realize it or not. I wonder, next time you see an idol or any form of objective art, Will you remember what it once stood for?